topic that, that um, is relevant to all of us wherever we live in the world. I'm obviously speaking from an American perspective. That's where I've lived for the last 22 years. I teach at Covenant Seminary uh, in counseling. Uh, and um, I, prior to that, I worked with the Labrie Fellowship in England for a number of years. And prior to that, I trained in medicine and then in psychiatry. So I have had a lot of interests. And uh, as, as I have got older and as I have now children and grandchildren, I, and I see what's happening in the world, and in my counseling practice, this topic becomes ever more relevant and important to talk about. So um, I came across this photograph a while ago of my wife and myself just before we, just after we got engaged uh, in the northernmost tip of Canada in Newfoundland. Um, and then I looked, suddenly discovered this one, uh, and I thought, is this what happens <laughs> because of sex? Is this all sex is about that you multiply? And another one came along a little after that photograph. Um, but obviously sex is for procreation. But it's far more. It's for companionship and expression of intimacy and the glue to a relationship. And it's also for the protection and nurture of children and of grandchildren as the building block of society. So the relationship that I have with my wife uh, is incredibly important for our children and our grandchildren. It's not just something that happens between the two of us, in a sense. Um, I, I spoke at Washington University in, in St. Louis a while ago uh, on sexuality. I was thinking, why did they invite this old guy um, to speak to young people about sex? Because I'm an almost extinct species uh, of someone I, I have only ever had sex with my wife. I've been married for 42 years. I went into marriage a virgin. I didn't grow up in the age of pornography. I grew up in a fairly protected Christian environment for which I am thankful. <clears throat> but now I see the pressures on children and uh, my children and my grandchildren, and, and I don't know how they survive and how you all survive in that. So let me share a little wisdom from my own you might say rather narrow experience, um, and yet hopefully something that I think is something that the Lord has given me as a, as a gift uh, over the years. <clears throat> so it's, it's asking not just what feels good, but what is the healthiest and best way to use the good gifts that God has given us, whether it's food or sex. And in the culture around us, of course, anything goes now. There are no boundaries, so you can do anything. Uh, and what I want to look at with you, first of all, at this first part, is just to look at the, what I call the agony, agony and the ecstasy of sex. Christopher West puts it well when he says, if you want to know what is most sacred in this world, all we need to do is to look for what is most violently profane. There is something profoundly good about sex, that God wants to be honored in and by, and therefore it is, it is profoundly profaned by the evil one. And when I made a list of the agony, the places of agony, where, where sexuality is involved, it got incredibly depressing. In pornography, and sexual addiction, and adultery, and prostitution, the agony of those who are employed in the porn industry, who, who often have to use drugs to do the things that they are asked to do, rape, sexual slavery, sexual violence. You know, I sit with people in counseling and hear stories of marital problems, of infidelity, of adultery, of abuse, of porn addiction, of homosexuality, of AIDS, stories of, of heartbreak and regret and, 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 uh, and agony. And thankfully, I also hear stories of profound change and wonderful healing. But beyond my counseling office, six in ten women in the world will experience some sort of sexual violence at the hands of men, and many young men too. 1.8 million children a year go into the commercial sex trade, it's estimated. In Sierra Leone, 26% of the victims of rape brought for treatment are under the age of 11, and some of those children were aged two or three. That's a horrific, horrible perversity, isn't it? 
We could go on the whole phenomenon of female genital mutilation in the Muslim culture, of unwanted pregnancies, of abortion, of sexually transmitted diseases of which there are over 25, and women bear the brunt of the effects of those because it also causes pelvic inflammatory disease and infertility and, uh, and miscarriages. And then the ravages are caused by sexual abuse, where they say that somewhere between one in three and one in four women have been sexually abused, and perhaps one in five, one in six men. And all the broken hearts that go with all of this. So this is indeed a war zone, isn't it? This is where the evil one is out to destroy the goodness that God has given us. Because our gender, which is part of your sexuality, we're not just talking about genital sex, your gender, your body, your genitality reveal something of God's glory. I wonder if you've ever asked yourself, how do my sexual organs reveal God's glory? <laughs> but it's true, it does. And evil despises beauty. And every person has been harmed in some way by the evil one who wants to implant lies. He wants to steal your dignity and your glory. He wants to accuse you and get you, in, uh, get you in, uh, deeply into shame and guilt. And if possible, he wants to kill you. So there's a desperate need that we should be talking about. Everyone else in the world is talking about sex. Why isn't the church talking about sex? How do we redeem sexuality? So you can see the force here of Christopher West's quote. If you want to know what is most sacred in the world, all we need to do for look to look for what is most violently profane. So that's the agony side. On the other side, there is the ecstasy. That it is one of the most profoundly pleasurable experiences known to human beings. A dopamine is, a, is, a, is a, a chemical, the pleasure chemical that's released in your brain. And if you, if you put a, a, an electrode into the brain of rats in, their, in, in the part of the brain that releases dopamine, they'll ignore everything else and just keep pressing that lever to get that stimulation to their dopamine, for their dopamine release. Um, and, uh, and our world is preoccupied with how to have great sex, how to get the greatest pleasure. It's the sort of craving and I've got to have it transmitter. So where are people learning about sex? Of course, we know from peers at school, from TV, from movies, from music, from porn. Um, so what we have to ask, what voices are people listening to? Where do they get? Where, what are the influences on their view of sex? That's what we're going to look at in this first half. What's shaping your imagination, your thinking, your feeling, your choices, your relationships? What's shaping your brain? We live in a culture of sexual liberation. And Graham Heath, back in 1978, in a book called The Illusory Freedom, talking about the sexual liberation, said Christians are seen as joyless, sexless, anti-life, anti-youth, and anti-progress. So the voices that young people are listening to, particularly as you grow from into puberty in your early teens, your body begins to come alive with all sorts of strange and wonderful sensations and things growing in different directions that you don't know what that means and feels very odd and uncomfortable. Your hormones are working overtime. Testosterone in young men is inc hugely increasing. Estrogen, pheromones, pheromones that sort of subconscious scent that, ar that arouses men, that is released by a woman that arouses men more at the time of a woman's ovulation, even though neither of them are aware that this is being given off. Oxytocin, the neuropeptide that facilitates attraction, the sort of what some people have called the love juice, the bonding hormone between a mother and the child, and it increases 500% in men at orgasm. So it's, in, it's released in order to bond you to the person you're having sex with. But at that age, you have sex on the brain, or it feels like it, doesn't it? Um, how to get some? What does sex mean? What is true love? Uh, what is, what's going on in me? So there's a lot of confusion, and, and nowadays more confusion too about orientation and gender and all of that. So the culture basically says, if it feels good, do it, doesn't it? Um, 
It's a biological urge. You eat when you're hungry. As the Bloodhound Gang said, you and me, baby, and nothing but mammals. So let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. <clears throat> so it, it, in a sense, it's seen as harmful to restrain this, this urge. It's, it, we go back again and again for more. And, and the question comes, do I have values that shape my desires, or do my desires form my values so that anything goes? We're shaped by the, the sexy body industry all around us in the advertising world, whether it's in pornography or in women's clothing, um, everywhere you go in the, in the airport or in the train station, in the supermarket, this is how you should look to attract the girls or the guys. Um, and then in movies, um, friends, uh, many movies have couples jumping into bed after meeting only once or twice. Um, that's the first thing they go to in relationship. And love basically means sex as soon as possible. Certainly to be indulged in if you really care about someone and there's no, certainly no need nowadays to wait until marriage if you even believe in marriage. You think of rap music. I have a good friend who's a rap musician, and he tells me that the basic message is that promiscuity is a badge of honor. Men denigrate women as merely objects of pleasure and encourage lesbianism and bisexuality as a means of enhanced pleasure. Most rap brags about sexual exploits. And then Cosmo magazine, apparently in the United States, it's the best-selling magazine on U.S. college campuses. The average student spends 70 minutes reading Cosmo magazine, and then it's passed on to an average of six other people. It, it, sexual liberation of the last 50 years means that we live in this culture awash with blatant sexuality, where Cosmo magazine cover at the checkout shouts in its headlines, Unleash Your Lust, or Orgasms Unlimited. So, why wait? <laughs> Many Christian young people are caught in this culture, and it's very hard for them to wait. We are the most stimulated generation, sexually stimulated generation because of the electronic media of any time in history. So we live in that why wait culture. We also live in what we call the hookup culture. Now, this is maybe particular to the United States, but translate it into your own culture that it's most common in the competitive elite colleges uh, in the United States from the research that's been done on it. And it is basically what we call friends with benefits. You, you, you're not, you don't have a dating relationship. You may, may be a little bit friendly, but it's not a deep friendship. But you have a sexual liaison. It's casual sex without much relationship attachment or commitment. A U.S. national survey found that 18 to 29-year-old college kids were not in committed, uh, sorry, I don't have the percentage here, but a very high percentage of 18 to 20, I think it was 68%, are not in a committed relationship and most are not interested in being in one because they're pursuing their college careers and, and dating gets in the way of of, um, of, of, of real um, uh, pursuit of your career. Uh, many uh, people in their final year in college have four to seven hookups in that year. Um, <clears throat> and men are more likely to initiate that sexual contact. contact. And it's found that... Um, that most students overestimate the amount of sex that is happening in other students' lives. And of course, this leads to a greater likelihood of following the perceived norm. Um, and then, of course, after enough of this, you may need to get drunk to go through with it. So hooking up is commonly associated with heavy drinking. And women, of course, are much more vulnerable to both hooking up and uh, the drinking. 80% of sexual abuse is, is alcohol-associated. Um, Tom Wolfe, the novelist, says, in the era of hooking up, this is a baseball analogy, um, first base means deep kissing, groping, and fondling. 
Second base meant oral sex. Third base meant going all the way. And home plate meant learning each other's names. But the research that's been done on, on hooking up shows that it is actually very detrimental to most women particularly. They're the ones who feel the psychological impact. Men seem to be more fallen and broken in being able to disconnect sex from relationship more easily. As this man, um, Budzizuski, however you pronounce his name, says, we are not designed for hooking up. We're designed for bodies and hearts to work together. Sex, designed as, sex is designed as an expression of unity of mind, emotion, spirit, and body. Sex is like adhesive tape. Promiscuity is like ripping the tape off again. If you rip it off, rip it off, rip it off, eventually the tape can't stick anymore. And then, of course, the porn culture, invading us like a plague everywhere we look, uh, on the internet and on our phones and sexting and tweeting and twerking and all the other things that people do, and I don't want to bore you with a lot of statistics here, but this is a, a billion dollar a year industry worldwide. In the United States, it earns more money than the whole uh, athletic complex of football and basketball and baseball combined. In, in about 10 years ago in Hollywood, it was estimated that Hollywood was producing about 400 regular movies, but uh, they were churning out just down the road in the Los Angeles warehouse they were churning out 11,000 porno movies because they're so quick and easy to make. There are millions of websites, and, but now the porn, the sort of porn industry for money on the internet uh, um, is actually declining because so many people are camming, meaning they are recording porn at home and putting it on the internet for free. So we talk about the pornification of the world in which we live. 25% um, of all daily search engine requests. These figures are hard to know how accurate they are. Young people being exposed to the internet up to porn somewhere between 8 and 11. 90% um, of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed porn. And uh, in one study in the United Kingdom, 1,013 to 16 year olds spent an average of an hour and 45 minutes a week looking at porn. Now porn, you have to understand, is very demeaning to women. It's not just nice, pleasant sex. Most porn has this sort of underlying assumption that all women at all times want sex from men. And women like all the sexual acts that men perform. And if they don't, then with a little force, they can be made to like them. So it's, it's, a, it's a profoundly demeaning thing to, to most women. And then, of course, there are all sorts of other types of porn as well that we'll mention a little later. So about, it's estimated 68% of, of United States college men and 18% women use porn at least once a week. Um, and they, that most of them say that viewing porn is, is, is a good way to express one's sexuality. It avoids relationship. It's very convenient. You get your sexual release. Um, and in the church, sadly, pornography is pretty frequently used. Uh, Rick Warren, in the survey in 2002 of pastors, found that 54% of them had viewed porn in the last year and 30% in the last month. And in the congregation... 61% had viewed it in the last year, 25% um, in the past month. Now, we generally think that women are, are the ones who get addicted to romantic novels. And by and large, that is true, because women prefer a, seems to prefer a, 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 a line, in the, a storyline, which has some relationships in it, whereas men just want the raw sex. Uh, this is changing somewhat, and it, it's estimated that the under 35 women are probably being conditioned to like the sort of raw sex type of porn more. But the older women, 35 plus, tend to still go, and romantic novels like this one are, are, are incredible bestsellers. Um, 
So visitors to porn sites in general, it's estimated about 72% male, 28% female. And 17% of all women struggle with porn, whereas at least 50% of men. And, and in the seminary where I work, basically most men, because we're sexual beings, struggle in some way to resist pornography. It's a, it's a, a problem for, for all of us. Um, and then some people, of course, go into the pain of sexual addiction. This book, Fifty Shades of Grey, where I got the title of this talk, partly, has sold over 100 million copies. It's been translated into 52 languages. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for two years. Hugely, and everyone was reading it about a year ago. Um, and it is, a, it is a fantasy novel with a lot of graphic sex in it. I read it, with my wife's permission, in order to understand what people were getting into. And I don't have time enough here to tell you more about it, but basically it is, it is about fantasy. It fits all the criteria of romantic fiction, where you have a fantasy person, the hero of this is, is a very wealthy, uh, very smart, very um, aesthetically sensitive, a sort of prince charming guy, and the heroine is a poor student who drives a battered old car, and she is sort of rescued by this prince, who turns out to be a sexual addict who's into bondage and domination and sadomasochism. And it turns out that he has a very checkered history. And there is actually some redemption in the story in that he gets somewhat transformed by his relationship with this woman. Um, and, uh, and, they, and he lives this incredible fantasy lifestyle of very wealthy dinners, beautiful music, multiple homes, helicopter that he owns, boat, car, and, um, and then he, they, at the end they buy a house on looking over Seattle Sound and have their children. And in fact, in the thing, she gets pregnant. She doesn't have an abortion, and they sort of live happily ever after, it seems, sort of fantasy romantic fairy tale at the end. But there's a lot of sex in it, which is, which is all sorts of kinky sex that is described. He has his red room of pain. So it's brought BDSM culture into the forefront of everyone's thinking, thinking this bondage and sadomasochism are normal, and we should all be into that for our sexual pleasure. Now, I, th I think that this help, that sort of fantasy helps you to escape reality. The biblical imagination described in the Song of Solomon that we'll come to in the second half actually helps you in to live in reality of the God-given gift of sex. So the pull of pornography is, is huge. It, 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 because real relationships are difficult, it's easy to go to get your quick fix uh, because you can control when and where you can masturbate with pornography. Fantasy is easier than reality, isn't it? Um, and rele you have release without responsibility. Um, you channel emotional tension. Many men have learned, particularly men, some women, have learned to masturbate in order to get rid of anxiety or boredom or depression or fear or anger. So it becomes a means of channeling your, your tension. And eventually, your brain gets changed by this, the chemicals in your brain, and you become addicted. You need more and more of more exotic sex to be stimulated, to feel aroused. So uh, this, there's always a danger in caricatures, but some people think this is the brain of the average male. It's certainly the brain of someone who's addicted to pornography, because all they think about is basically, how can I get the next fix? Um, you're feeding the brain with images. But some women, too, now are getting hooked on sex, too. So it's not just a male problem. And the poison of porn, and here I cannot spend too long, but basically it's like junk food. You know, you eat it, it tastes great, and you don't think it's doing you any harm at the time. But 20 years down the road, you go to the doctor and you discover you've been eating far too much junk food for too long, and you're going to die. Um, the same with sex. The effects may come much more quickly 
it, it gives people an exaggerated sense, perception of the sexual activity in society. It leads to diminished trust between intimate couples. It, it splits relationship and sex. Um, it leads to the belief that you can abandon any hope of sexual monogamy and that promiscuity is the natural state. Um, and and it, believe, it leads you to the belief that abstinence and sexual inactivity are unhealthy. A cynicism about love or the need for affection between sexual partners. A belief that marriage is sexually confining. A lack of attraction to family and child raising. Basically, anything goes in porn. And it's bisexual. It's homosexual. It's multiple partners. It's sex with animals. It's sex with machines. All sorts of things that you really don't want to even fantasize about. Most people don't. So the porn culture, the social media culture of Facebook, of Tumblr, of camming, of sexting. Um, Facebook encourages the creation of false impressions and images and stories about users and events and relationships as more sexualized and subject to change than they really are or intend to be says uh, one guy, Wigneris, who's done a lot of research on premarital sex in America. And then you have the GLBTQ culture um, of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, questioning, and now they've added intersexual and asexual. Uh, what are we? Who are we? What gender am I? What sexual orientation am I? Is anything open to me? So we live in a world where there's a deconstruction of the heteronormative culture. A world where fluid sexuality is seen as the norm. You can perhaps choose. You can be anything you want to be. Where gay marriage now is becoming legalized in so many uh, countries, so many states in North America, so many countries first in Western Europe. Um, where you may question your, even your gender. So we're left then with big questions. And our culture lives, and this quote by Carl Rogers I, I use very often because it sort of speaks of where we are today. Experience is for me, he says, the highest authority. It, to, it is to experience that I must return again and again to discover a closer approximation to the truth as it is becoming in me. Neither the Bible nor the prophets, neither Freud nor research, Neither the revelations of God or man can take precedence over my own direct experience. Isn't that where most people live today? Going from one experience to another to feel alive. And a lot of that experience, because it's so intense, tends to be sexual experience. So essentially we've thrown out the maker's instructions. We've burned the map and we're left to try and find our way through the desert of life or the ocean of life without a chart, without a map. Um, and, and, and the church and Christian, Christian teaching, you would think, would give us the right answers on this. And thankfully, nowadays we are seeing more good teaching on this coming from the church. But historically, the church has had its own sexual distortions, which are confusing. Um, and we, we have a sort of this body, spirit, body is bad, spirit is good heritage that comes down from Platonism and the Gnostic suspicion of the body in the early church fathers. So that um, Jerome, one of the early church fathers, said, anyone who is too passionate a lover with his own wife is himself an adulterer. You can have sex, but don't enjoy it. Don't get too sexually aroused. That's carnal. That's of the flesh, not the, the, the spirit. We read of Augustine's struggle, and for a long while, Augustine, I think, was sexually addicted in his youth. And then he swings to the opposite extreme because he can't deal with any sexual temptation. But towards the end of his life, he comes back to a more balanced view, I think, on this. But the sad legacy of, the, of, of distorted Christian teaching is that sex is dangerous and dirty, there's a lot of shame and guilt associated with it. With your kids, if you're a parent, you shouldn't talk about it uh, too much. You avoid it. You maybe uh, 
put, tell them to put their hands over their eyes if something comes up on the television that's a bit sexy, or, or you don't allow them to watch anything like that. And there's a lot of fear and suspicion of sexuality. And, and, and then we have, of course, the tradition within the Catholic Church and many churches of sexual abuse, which is so horrific. Um, and uh, so we, we live in a world here of what I think is what we might call a perfect storm. Um, how can we live in the midst of this storm and be faithful to the biblical narrative, the biblical story, when we are being tossed around in the ocean and in the winds and in the hurricanes of the culture that I've just described. The children, and I didn't mention the children of divorce culture. Many people nowadays whose parents have divorced and they, they don't know how to trust people. They don't know how to communicate well in relationships. The why wait culture, the porn culture, the hookup culture, the social media culture, the gay and lesbian culture, the GBLTQ culture and fluid sexuality, the BDSM culture of, of uh, shades of gray, the anything goes culture. So we have to ask in our second part, after we've asked what voices are you listening to, um, <clears throat> Because behind all these voices are the two original voices in the Garden of Eden. God's voice about creation. Men and women different with the potential of becoming one flesh. And God saying, this was very good. And then the other voice. Did God really say? Did God really say, is God good? Can you trust the Maker's instructions? Really, he's, he's a killjoy God. He doesn't want to, you to enjoy much. The devil loves this world of instant gratification. There's no need to wait for the best. It's much easier to trust something that is tangible and looks and feels and tastes so good, like that fruit in the garden, than to trust in the immaterial and the intangible of God's love and of his promises.